Hello and welcome to Art Appreciation. This is FINA H101 presented by IPFW, uh, that's Indiana University, Purdue University at Fort Wayne. Uh, this is week one of our lectures describing a work of art. If you haven't already, make sure you take the time to read over our syllabus and schedule and take a close look at our Blackboard uh, website to make sure you understand what's going on in the course and the use of these lectures. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please email me. My email address can be found uh, on the Blackboard site. Uh, as you watch this week's lecture, you should have your list of terms on hand. You can find that on the Blackboard site. Go ahead and down that, download that. Uh, this will contain um, <clears throat> a list of terms. You will find the definitions for those terms both in this lecture and in your textbook. Also before beginning, uh, make sure you have done that reading from the textbook. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to do so already, uh, you might want to pause this video and make sure you do that reading. I'm going to be doing our weekly lectures with the assumption that you've done the reading ahead of time. Uh, if you've not yet purchased your textbook, uh, I do encourage you to do so either through IPFW's bookstore or on Amazon, whatever service you prefer. Uh, you but it is necessary to your success in the class. Uh, so my name is Aaron Schwartz. I'll be your professor, uh, and I hope we can learn a lot together. It's a little bit disconnected doing an online course. I do kind of miss the interaction with the students that I would get in a classroom. Uh, as you're taking notes and watching these lectures, I do encourage you to, in fact, take notes. Uh, I'll encourage you to pause the video uh, at several times uh, to jot down some ideas, some definitions, uh, some points that I make about the pieces. Doing this is going to help you participate in the class. It's going to help you participate successfully uh, in the blogs and online discussion. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. And these videos will be available all the time on YouTube. So if you feel like you missed something, feel free to come back and watch them again. And again, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, make sure you email me right away and let me know. So, I think that's all we need to say about that. Um, so, from now, let's move on to our first slide and get into this week's topic, which is describing a work of art. The first artwork we'll be discussing is a painting by Louise Million entitled Still Life with a Bowl of Curacao Oranges, dated to 1634. A still life is a representation of inanimate objects, such as bowls of fruit or vases of flowers. This painting is a good illustration of the characteristic style of the Baroque period, a style of art dating from the late 16th and 17th centuries. Baroque art typically is characterized by dynamic movement, dramatic contrasts of light and dark, and displays of overt emotion, or perhaps compositional choices intended to provoke emotion from the artwork's viewers. In the case of a Baroque still life, this emotional drama is a little harder to spot, but it is still there. You might find twisting lines and complex shapes, also sharp contrast between light and dark that might spark emotion. So take a moment to consider how this painting is Baroque. How does it evoke emotion in you, in your own words, in your notes? The section you read in Harrison focuses on description, and by description we mean a statement or account that relays a mental image of something. If you met somebody and wanted to accurately describe him or her to someone else, you talk not only about what they looked like, but how they acted, what kind of person they were, and maybe even how you felt in response to them. Describing a work of art isn't all that different. You need to relay more information than just what is pictured, but how it's depicted, and maybe what it makes us think of, what, it might, what we might think it symbolizes, and even how we feel when looking at it. So consider this piece, and look at your textbook. Uh, how is this described by our author, Harrison? What aspects does Harrison highlight in his description of the painting? How would you describe it differently? And what did his outside perspective and description include that you might have otherwise missed? Uh, for example, he has a lot to say about the bowl, the type of bowl depicted in the painting. Uh, 
Take a moment to organize your thoughts and then we'll move on to the next slide. This is another example of a still life painting and a great illustration of why when we describe a work of art we need to relay more information than simply what is pictured. This painting, like the previous one we looked at, also shows a dish with fruit in it, but even so I think you'll agree that it's very different in its appearance. So take a moment to describe this painting. What words would you use to describe this painting? and do so in comparison to the Moyon painting we just watched, we just looked at. Uh, how are they different? How are they the same? In describing the differences between the two paintings, you've just employed an important tool in art appreciation called comparison. That is simply looking at similarities and differences between two or more related artworks. Simple, right? Through this process, we often learn more about and see more of each work than if we just considered them on their own. One final question you might want to think about is whether or not you think this looks like a real bowl of fruit, like you might actually see on a counter in someone's kitchen. When we think about visual images in these terms, we are thinking about realism, that is, a depiction or of a scene, person, or image as it would appear in nature. Now, in your opinion, does this painting, or the still life by Melian, demonstrate a higher level of realism? In other words, which one looks more real to you? You may have strong feelings about this one way or another, but there's actually no correct answer here. Realism in art, you might be surprised to learn, is surprisingly subjective. Uh, so I bet we all have differences of opinion on this. Just be sure, when you're thinking about it, to be specific in describing what aspects of the painting you think demonstrate greater realism. Style, color, level of detail, quality of light. Uh, it'll be interesting uh, in the blog and in other assignments to see what you guys think about this. Now this a work of art is not a still life but instead a depiction of Christ on the cross, a crucifixion scene. It's painted by the Spanish painter Francisco de, Zer uh, de Zerberan uh, in 1640. And the difference gives us an opportunity to talk about subject matter. Subject matter is the underlying content of a work of art, what it is that it is being depicted in particular painting or sculpture. While very different in subject matter from Moyon's painting of a bowl of fruit, they were done in approximately the same era. They are both examples of Baroque art. As such, they have similar, recognizably Baroque styles. Style is defined as the manner in which an artist portrays an image. So you might want to look in your book or further back in this video uh, and try to describe a definition of the Baroque uh, and try to figure out how this painting and that still life painting have the same style, that same Baroque style. To help you with that, I'd like to clarify a couple more terms. Content is similar to subject matter, but is more specific. Content entails the individual elements that make up the subject matter of a work of art. We can also talk about form, that is the overall plan, structure, or shape or of an image or work of art. So consider, if the subject matter here is Christ's crucifixion, what aspects of it make up the content, the form, and how does that help define the style? Can you describe this painting using the terms subject matter, form, style, and content? Take a moment to think about that and maybe jot down some ideas and then we'll move on to the next slide. This modern 20th century painting by the German expressionist painter Emil Noda from 1912 also portrays the crucifixion as its subject matter, but its form, content, and especially its style are very different than the Baroque example we just looked at. So how would you describe this painting using the term subject matter, form, style, and content? How is it similar and different from the Baroque version that we just looked at? Some of you might have observed that there are more people in this modern painting. When we describe art, we typically call the people figures. All that means is that it's a representation of a person. 
When you're looking at this painting and you compare it to the previous painting, do you get a different feeling or emotional reaction when looking at these paintings? Why do you think that is? Or, because it's the same subject matter, do you get exactly the same feeling? This is obviously very subjective, but it's going to help you in this class to be able to really think about and be able to articulate these subtle differences in your reaction to a work of art. So take a moment for that, and then we'll move on to the next image. This is a portrait of a princess by the Italian artist Pisanello. It was created in 1436 during the Renaissance. The Renaissance refers to a historic period in Europe during the 1400s and 1500s. The term Renaissance literally means rebirth, referring to a rebirth of ancient Greek and Roman arts and culture. Renaissance comes right before the Baroque period that we've already discussed. In Renaissance art, there's an emphasis on idealization, that is, the representation of an image according to ideal standards of beauty rather than real life. This then contrasts with realism, which attempts to depict things as they actually appear in nature. Although the figure in this painting is idealized, it is still a portrait. A portrait is a representation of a specific individual, meaning an actual person. When a portrait includes recognizable features and characteristics, when it actually looks like a particular person, that can be described as a likeness. So while this portrait then portrays the likeness of a particular princess as a typical Renaissance work, it shows her in a more ideal way than she might have actually looked. For example, she might have had blemishes or wrinkles or even hair on her forehead. At this time, it was considered uh, ideal beauty for women to have high hairlines and large foreheads like we see in this example. The subject matter here is the princess. The princess is depicted, depicted in profile, that is, from the side, probably in order to show off her long neck, fancy hairdo, and high, high forehead. Profile also allows portrait artists to show off some of the more, more unique features that help us recognize individuals. The slope of the nose, the shape of the ear, the thickness of the lips, the chin, and the jawline. In terms of symbolism, which is the representation of intangible meaning through visual form, or investing a visual form with meaning that is not literal, we see that the background includes various flowers and even a butterfly. These, for example, probably refer to fertility. Keeping all this in mind, and using some of these terms, idealism, portrait, likeness, symbolism, what do you think was the aim of this painting? What was the artist trying to tell us about this young woman, and what did this, or what did this young woman and her family want us to know about her? And again, uh, the Harrison can give you a little bit of historical background in detail on this, uh, but do be thinking about how you want to articulate your specific response to this painting. This is also a portrait of a young woman, but it's very different from the Renaissance portrait we just looked at. It was painted over 400 years later by Gustave Courbet. You might recognize his name and the style of painting. He painted the second, the second still life image of a fruit in a dish that we looked at earlier. This portrait is entitled, entitled The Seer, as in a person who's looking beyond this world, maybe at ghosts or at least to the supernatural. Looking at this painting, how can you tell she's not looking at us, the viewer? How can you tell she's not just posing for a portrait, but she's known as her work for a seer? As a portrait, how is this painting similar to the Renaissance portrait of a princess? Or how does it achieve the same things? And again, what do you think the aim of this portrait was? What did the artist want to tell us about this woman? What more do you want to know about her? Are your questions about here different from any questions that came to your mind about the Renaissance princess? This sort of compare and contrast, our reactions to uh, these images, are going to be very helpful for us understanding the subtle differences between content, form, and style. So take a moment to organize your thoughts on that.
So far, we've looked at still life paintings and portraits. This is an example of a landscape. A landscape is defined as a representation of the outdoors. There can be people or buildings, but the scene itself must be done under the open sky, whether or not the sky is actually depicted. This painting is entitled Cloister Ruin by Caspar David Friedrich. It is painted in 1825 and is an example of Romanticism in painting. Romanticism is an artistic style and period dating to the late 1700s and early 1800s. It is characteristically uh, aimed to evoke strong emotions in the viewer with an emphasis on aesthetic experience. That is, it uses picturesque beauty to play on our emotions. As you look at this piece, try to figure out how you would describe the qualities of Romanticism illustrated in this particular painting. But first, let's look a bit more closely at the content of this painting scene. There are two small figures, a humble farmhouse that's built in the ruins of a grand but fallen cloister. A cloister is just a large church building. All of this is surrounded and embraced by nature. Romanticism often uses light to convey meaning. This is not quite like the contrasting light we saw in ex examples of Baroque painting. In Romanticist painting, the artist controls where the sky, where in the sky the light is coming from in order to direct the viewer's eye towards particular features or perhaps to suggest a narrative going on behind the scenes that might play on the viewer's emotion. One final thing to consider as we look at this painting is the vantage point. Vantage point is the position of the viewer within the scene. In other words, where are we in relation to the figures and objects depicted by the artist? In this particular painting, what do you think our vantage point is? Are we standing in the landscape? Are we looking in from above? How does this influence the story you imagine taking place in the scene? And why do you think, especially in terms of a romantic landscape painting, that the artist chose to give us the specific vantage point that he did? This is another landscape painting, also showing a farmhouse, and has nearly the same date as Friedrich's painting as well. This one, called Galebe Farm, was done in 1927 by John Constable. Consider how this is also an example of Romanticism. You might want to compare, in these two paintings, the light source, vantage point, subject matter, style, content, all of these terms we've been talking about. Also consider how it plays on your emotions. Does it give you any of the same feelings as the previous landscape? How do you feel differently? And here's the tricky part. Why do you feel differently? What is it about the execution of this piece that maybe uh, sparks a different kind of emotion in you? These are tricky questions, guys, and I understand that some of you may be struggling with trying to figure out how to articulate these things. Um, all I'm asking at this point, just give it a try. Really give yourself some time. Really try to put into words what you see in these paintings. Um, going to these compositional elements of subject matter, style, form, content should help give you a rubric uh, with which to organize your thoughts. Uh, but I know most of you are not are not used to looking at art in this way, not used to talking about art or thinking about art this way. And that's exactly what an art appreciation course is for, is to get us to slow down, really look at the pictures, really consider how the artist is manipulating the scene. So again, I know it might feel awkward, but like I said, I'm not going to grade your notes. Um, this is just for you to start to learn how to articulate things about art. So with that in mind, take a few moments to answer those questions and compare this landscape with the previous landscape. Uh, and in the next slide, we're going to look at something a little bit different. This artwork we're looking at is not a painting at all. It's a part of a wall from an Islamic mosque. It's a prayer niche called a mihrab. The niche is ornamented within the building, excuse me, oriented within the building so it points to the Muslim holy city of Mecca and indicates the direction towards which the congregation faces the, to pray. 
The entire surface of the wall is covered in glazed ceramic tile, and the tile borders surrounding the niche bear writing. These are prayers written in Arabic calligraphy. It says, God is the light of heaven and earth, and goes on to complete the verse. Now is a great time to really take a look at the details of the ornament. Uh, that is the decoration on the surface intended to make beautiful or make it more interesting to the eye. Here we see ornament consisting of calligraphy, flowers, vines, and geometric designs on the tiles. You can also see, as you move away from the piece, that the ornamental details fit together to form an overall star-like pattern. A pattern is defined as a repetition or rhythm in which shape, line, color, and texture are organized on the surface. Another example of a pattern would be the alternating red-white bands on the edge of the niche. This is an example of non-objective art, meaning it does not aim to depict any person, place, or thing. I'd like you to consider how we can describe the Islamic rep representation or method of showing the world. We can't say this is a portrait or there's a farmhouse. Uh, if we can't say those things, then how do we describe this? How would you describe this to somebody who can't see it? Try to use these terms, pattern, ornament, line, and color. And then we'll take a look at another kind of tricky example of, of this kind of description. The final art of, or work of art we'll be looking at this week uh, is a painting by Barnett Newman from 1951. This is not only non-objective, but is an example of non-representational. It's art without any definable subject matter. The title in ancient Latin is Vir Heroicus Sublimis, and it actually doesn't tell us at all about what we see on the canvas. It just means man, heroic and sublime. Now the artist said that this painting wasn't meant to be viewed from far away. He wanted people to look at it very close up and be surrounded by and immersed in the red. So put this baby on full screen and really look at it. So the challenge for today's lesson is to try to describe this. And I know you're tempted to just say it's a big red painting. Uh, but let's try to be a little bit more precise than that. How can you go about describing a work of art that does not represent? Start by focusing on line and color. Explain your experience being visually immersed in the red. Try to use the terms we have. Obviously, subject matter doesn't apply. Um, and this is an image I would encourage you to go online, do a Google search of this one, and take a look at some other images of it. This is a huge painting. And I know this video just, does, just doesn't quite capture what it looks like in person. Um, so you may benefit from taking a, a, a different look, maybe an installation view at it. Um, there are limitations to presenting the art in this format. But give it a try. Try to use this, these terms that we've been talking about. How do you describe something that doesn't actually represent? Later on the semester we'll be talking about why Barnett Newman wanted to paint a big red painting. and. Uh, this idea of minimalism and these big color field paintings. If this is a painting that doesn't appeal to you right away, that's fine. I'm not asking you to fall in love with the painting, uh, but do try to give it a good, honest attempt at description. Later on this semester, we'll describe the historical reasons why Barnett Newman painted in this fashion. So in conclusion, uh, now that we're done with this week's unit, what should you be uh, doing um, now that you've watched this lecture? Make sure you're going back to our Blackboard website frequently. Uh, make sure that you're completing the blog and the quiz before the deadline is up. Uh, late work is not accepted, so make sure you understand the schedule and you're completing everything on time. Uh, this lecture will be available on YouTube uh, the entire time, so feel free to come back and look at this anytime you want. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, again, uh, my email can be found on the Blackboard website. Please feel free to email me any concerns you might have. Uh, so until next week, thank you very much. I hope you learned something today, and I will um, talk at you next week. Thank you.